Hello, welcome. So, I have been researching a lot about Gabby Petito and what happened to her. I've been watching a lot of videos about it, reading a lot of articles about it. And I want to talk about some things. So in this video, I want to talk about Gabby Petito's case. Not necessarily her case in detail, but rather the internet's overall treatment of Gabby Petito's case. Because that is fascinating to me. This story has blown up over the past few days. In the beginning of Gabby Petito's disappearance, her Instagram only had about a thousand followers. Now it has approximately a million followers. That's a lot. And a big reason why people are fascinated with this case is because of true crime. And part of it has to do with the fact that true crime is more popular than ever. There are so many true crime podcasts and there are so many Netflix documentaries. There are so many uh, true crime YouTubers who specifically talk about uh, true crime and and it is an interesting subject. And this case is literally a true crime case which is unfolding in front of our eyes. And that has captivated a lot of people. And that's what I want to talk about in this video. I want to talk about people's fascination with this case. And exactly how do people who research murder cases, true crime cases... For morbid curiosity, react to an ongoing case which involves the FBI, the police, and a victim of homicide. So let's jump into it. So if you don't know anything about Gabby Petito, well, here's just a quick little summary of what happened. Gabby Petito was a 22-year-old girl who left for a cross-country trip on July 2nd with her fiancé, but never returned. The plan was that they would spend four months there. But her fiancé, 23-year-old Brian Laundry, came back to his home in Florida on September 1st without her. He drove back using the same white van that they had used on their trips. Before this blew up, Gabby had approximately 1,000 followers on Instagram. Now she has about a million and she had recently started a YouTube account documenting their van life journey. Ten days after Brian returned back, um, Gabby's family reported Gabby missing to the authorities, saying that they hadn't had any contact with Gabby since last week of August. It is important to note that Brian was not the one to report it to the authorities. It was Gabby's family. At that time, Brian declined to talk to the police or cooperate with the investigation in any manner. But because he seems to be the last person who had seen Gabby, he was declared a person of interest by the FBI. But he wasn't charged with anything. There's also evidence that they were having some relationship issues. There was a 911 call that Gabby made in which she said to the operator, her fiancé Brian, hit her and slapped her. So the authorities in Utah were informed about this and they responded to the call on 12th August. There is about an hour's worth of body cam footage from this incident. From watching the footage, it's clear that Gabby was very emotional and she could hardly talk without crying or breathing heavily. She stated to the Utah authorities that she had been fighting with Brian all morning and because she heard the police sirens she tried to get Brian's attention towards that and she hit him and that caused the vehicle to curb. However, the police states the cop didn't want it to escalate the situation any further as they were in love and engaged and they described it as a mental health break rather than a domestic assault. Brian was told by the authorities to stay in a hotel while Gabby kept the van. Gabby Petito was last seen checking out of a hotel with Brian in Utah on August 24th. And she made her last call to her mom on August 25th. And last text messages were sent by her between August 26th and August 27th. However, Gabby's family raises doubts that these texts were actually sent by her. A few days later, 
a body matching the description of Gabby Petito was found in Grand Teton. And autopsy on Tuesday showed that, yes, it was Gabby. To this, Brian Laundrie's family released a statement saying the news was heartbreaking and the country was mourning Gabby. However, it is important to note that Laundrie's family uh, did not necessarily comply with the police. At that point, Brian, the person who had last seen Gabby, his whereabouts were still unknown. And Brian's family did not release any info about Brian's whereabouts until Friday. This was very accurately described by people on social media as giving Brian a head start. Petito's family also released a statement about laundry, saying, and I quote, All of Gabby's family want the world to know Brian isn't missing, he's hiding. But in the end, they did uh, release information about Brian's whereabouts and said that Brian went to Carlton Reserve outside Northport, Florida. And currently, Brian's whereabouts are unknown and the search for him continues. So that's what we know. Let's now talk about the social media aspect of this story. So this story blew up on social media. And it undoubtedly had a positive impact because it got more eyes to the story. And because it got more attention, it became a high-profile case and affected the way the investigation was carried out, the response of the police and the FBI. Undoubtedly, that's the case. And it was a good thing. Gabby Petito's family, when they first talked about it on social media, They talked about it because they were worried that if they don't get people's attention on this story, um, the story is going to get buried. And that will affect the way law enforcement conduct their investigation. So that is undoubtedly a good thing. However, there are some aspects of social media that's uh, insensitive to say the least. Like for instance... There is a particular person on TikTok who is a social media psychic who has made many, many TikToks talking about the energy of Brian and how his energy doesn't feel like a killer. He, his energy does not feel like a killer. I do feel that he was working on himself. I do feel like he did have a hot temper, but I don't feel like he would have purposely killed her in a way where in his logical mind. That being said, I do feel like he took her life, okay? And it's very interesting because I feel like he almost had to take her life because in his logical mind, that was the right thing to do. That essentially translates to, well, I'm attracted to him, so I don't want to think of him as a bad guy. What the hell's wrong with people, I swear to God. There are also people who are playing um, internet detectives and they talk about the most mundane things about Gabby like the fact that she changed uh, her playlist her Spotify playlist a few days before she went missing and they're dissecting the lyrics of the last song that she changed I'm just like look unless one of those songs happened to be a recording of Brian confessing to um, killing Gabby It doesn't matter. People listen to music on Spotify. That's the thing people do. It's not that, it's not that deep. Stop, stop existing. There are also people on TikTok who started this rumor that Brian was reading a book called Annihilation before uh, they went on the trip. And that part is true, by the way. There is evidence of that. However, the misinformation that TikTok spread was that Annihilation was a book about how two girls went missing. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not. Literally, the author of Annihilation had come out on Twitter and said, no, that's not what Annihilation is about. It's not about two girls who who go missing. No, TikTok, stop it. You're making everyone's brains rot at this point. And the amount of conspiracy theories there are about Gabby is insane. There are also people who are pointing out that, oh no, Gabby's godmother 
and brother are still following Brian on Instagram. Yeah, I believe this post said something along the lines of, Oh, I know that social media isn't everyone's cup of tea, but I just noticed that Gabby's godmother and brother are still following Brian. Yeah, right, that should be the main focus of Gabby's godmother and brother right now. What even are you? An alien pretending to be human? Because I don't believe you are human. This post that I talked about came from a subreddit about Gabby Petito, which now has approximately 100 thousand followers it has a lot of people who are just making conspiracy theories about gabby's disappearance there are a lot of people who want to act as internet detectives who want to help they uh, they do want to help i'm not saying that they don't want to help at all but the thing is they are not involved with the case whatsoever And they don't need to be involved, but they want to get involved. They want to insert themselves into this story. And I know how harsh that sounds, because I do believe that a lot of these people do genuinely care about this case. But the thing is simply that these people are not in the case, and they don't need to be in the case. But they still want to help somehow, and so this is what they do. Part of the reason why this is bad is just because it's distasteful and disrespectful. You know, we just learned about Gabby's death. Another reason why it's bad and arguably a more important reason is because internet sleuthing has a very dark history, specifically when it comes to Reddit. I don't know if you guys know about the subreddit Find the Boston Bombers, but It's literally one of the worst things that has happened on Reddit. What happened, essentially, was a family of an innocent man who was murdered was being harassed because the Reddit thought that dead person was one of the Boston bombers. Here's an article about it. What it's like when Reddit wrongly accuses your loved one of murder. In April, a family was grieving for their missing 22-year-old son. Sunil Tripathi had been missing for more than a month. His roommate at Brown University hadn't seen him since March 16th. His mother, Judy, father, Akhil, and sister, Sangeeta, worked with Brown and the FBI to find him for almost eight weeks. They created a Facebook page, Help Us Find Sunil Tripathi, in case Sunil logged online. There he'd find messages from loved ones praying for his safe return. In the middle of searching for their son, a new search for Sunil began on the 70 million member online community, Reddit. In less than 24 hours, Sunil's name spread all over the internet as the face of one of the two Boston Marathon bombing suspects. But he wasn't guilty. As his family would soon learn, He was dead. In a haunting interview with the New York Times, Sunil's family reveals what it's like to be on the other end of a Reddit witch hunt, watching your innocent son get thrust into the national spotlight and accused of a horrific crime. The Reddit community, which proved to be helpful in surfacing info about Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooting, started a thread. Members began hunting for similar-looking suspects online, trying to solve the mystery from computer chairs. Within minutes, brands worn by bombers were correctly identified on Reddit and 4chan, but then a user stumbled upon Tripathi's family Facebook page for Sunil. His photo was copied, pasted next to the photo of the youngest bombing suspect, and uploaded to Reddit. Along with the photo comparison, the user submitted information about the missing brown student. From there, misinformation and speculation spiraled out of control. Within hours, nasty commenters began invading Sunil's Facebook page. Later that night, when an MIT police officer was shot and killed, the messages became too much for Tripathi family. They took down the page, which only fueled Reddit and Twitter's fire. The internet fate of Sunil Tripathi was finally sealed minutes later when 
Your Anon News, a Twitter news feed connected to the hacker collective Anonymous, tweeted out your party's name to hundreds of thousands of people who followed the account. By 3 a.m., in many heavily trafficked corners of the internet, it was accepted that Sunil was suspect number two, and Reddit had gotten there first. It was a long evening for a Tripathi family. NBC's Pete Williams helped clear Sunil's name when he confirmed that the missing boy was not one of the suspects at 5.16 a.m., but the damage had already been done. Sunil's sister was called 58 times between 3 and 4.15 a.m. That day, Kong reports, the family told Kong it received hundreds of threatening and anti-Islamic messages, although they are not Muslim. Groups that had been working with Tripathi family to find their son shed away, thinking he might still be one of the Boston bombers. Now, you know, Sunil happened to be dead at that point, you know. But what if he was alive? What if, what if he was alive and somebody had kidnapped him or something along those lines? What if he was alive and the organizations that were helping the family to find Sunil just decided to not do that, decided to just walk away because there are some rumors that he might be one of the Boston bombers. That's terrifying. That's fucking terrifying. That's the power of rumors and speculations. And that's why when it comes to active cases like this one, like with the Gabby Petito case, we should be more careful. It's still an ongoing case. We don't have all the information that the FBI and the police have. Let's not play internet detectives. Let's not place blame on anyone. We are not detectives. It's the police and the FBI's job. Having said all that, it's pretty clear. In this case, the attention that this case is getting has done a lot of good. Because this case has become a high-profile case, law enforcement is taking it more seriously, which is good. Obviously, that's good. But (laughs) I think I would be doing a disservice if I didn't mention... Oh yeah, you you guessed it right. The missing white woman syndrome. Now, let me be clear. I am glad that Gabby Petito's case is getting attention. I'm very happy that law enforcement is taking it seriously. However, I just wish we would have the same energy when people of color go missing. Now, there are people who have said, well, you know, that's not really true. Uh, The missing white woman syndrome, that's not that's not real. Well, it is real. There are studies done on it. There are journalists who say, yeah, missing white women get a lot more attention than when people of color go missing. Here's one horrific statistic that I found about this. Only 30% of missing indigenous people actually make the news when they go missing. Compare that to 51% of white people who go missing. Now that shows race plays an important factor when a person goes missing. And honestly, I am surprised even for people who go missing, uh, white people who go missing, it's the stat is just 51%. How is that so low? Why is it so low? Shouldn't it be like somewhere around 95% for both of them? I'm just saying, why is the statistic so low? Even 51% for the white uh, victims seem low. And 30% for indigenous people? That's just criminal. And you see, it's a cycle. You know, the news media reports that a white woman has gone missing. That case, because the news media reported it, becomes high profile. Because it becomes high profile, law enforcement take it more seriously and conduct more detailed investigations Because of those detailed investigations, they find more proof and the media then reports on that proof and the cycle goes on again. It's a cyclical cycle. All cycles are cyclical. What am I saying? Oh my god. It is a cycle. And if you're wondering, that's also the same with TikTok, which use algorithm. You know, the algorithm detects that, oh, a white woman has gone missing. 
the algorithm notes, you know, oh, look, a TikTok about a white woman who goes missing goes viral. So it gets recommended to more people and it goes viral. And because it goes viral, it becomes a high profile case and law enforcement take it more seriously. And because of that, they get more evidence. And that's when TikTokers make more TikToks about that case. And the cycle continues again. And when the next time a white woman goes missing, the algorithm's going to recognize that, oh yeah, it's another white woman who goes missing. Those videos about white women going missing gets a lot more views than videos about people of color going missing. And voila, you have an algorithm which is basically racist. And by the way, if you're wondering, it's not just limited to algorithm. TikTok has come out and said that they told moderators to suppress posts by ugly people and poor people. I don't know if you know this about people in China, but they find black people the most unattractive. There is a lot more racism against black people in China than you think. And they automatically consider black people to be less attractive. That's why if you're wondering that, oh, why is all of my For You page filled with white people? Uh, there you go. Basically, TikTok told their moderators to suppress posts by black people. This article by Intercept was released last year. And honestly, I didn't hear anyone talk about it. And I was just like, what? Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares that TikTok basically admits to manually suppress posts by people who the, the moderators consider unattractive or ugly or poor. Like, nobody cares about that. That's news to me. So, anyways, what I'm trying to say is that we are automating racism and that's not good. So yeah, that's all that I have for this video, I guess. Um, before I end this video, I just want to say, um, currently we don't know the cause of Gabby Petito's death. It was ruled homicide, which, which basically means she was killed by someone, but we don't know by whom yet. And it's likely, we don't know that yet, but it's likely that her partner, Brian, was the person who committed the, the murder. We don't know that yet, but a lot of the proof does point in that direction. So knowing that he most likely killed her, I just want to say out loud, please don't stay in abusive relationships. I know friends who have been in abusive relationships and this is how they describe physical assault. They say, oh, he was just tired. He needed a break. That's all. It won't happen again. And they're somehow convinced that their partner won't do that again. But they, they are convinced that the partner would not do that again. But of course, it happens again and again. I know somebody who was stuck in a different country with an abusive relationship where they had to share an apartment and... And they realized that they were in an abusive relationship when their partner literally was choking them. Like, like choking them to death. And she would get heart palpitations because she was stuck living in the same apartment as her boyfriend. And now that she talks to me about it, she says, oh my god, I didn't even realize that there were so many signs. I, how did I miss them all? Please. Look out for those signs, okay? And stay safe. So yeah, that's all. Um, like this video if you liked it. Comment your thoughts down below about what you think. Um, thank you to the members of the channel for supporting these videos. And yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!